What have you got planned for today? Do you fancy visiting one of the world's largest flower gardens with me? Today is the 29th of March and we're going to Kirkenhof in the Netherlands. Now Kirkenhof means kitchen garden, but this place is so much more than that implies. It covers an area of 79 acres, that's 32 hectares, and seven million bulbs are planted annually. Kirkenhof is famous for its tulips, but today we're going to see breathtaking displays of daffodils, hyacinths, crocuses, fritillarias, and early tulips. We'll also see the late tulips too, and see the latest trends and fashions that are coming, and you'll hear my top picks. Because you know me, if you watch the channel, I only grow tulips that are reliably perennial that come back every year. Now, Kirkenhof has been closed for the last two years because of COVID, so it's time to enjoy. Come with me and let's enjoy Kirkenhof Gardens in spring. Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwensa Garden in Ireland and I'm glad you could join me today as we visit Kirkenhof Gardens in the Netherlands. Our visit is a day trip which starts pretty early in the morning with a bus to Dublin Airport. But by 11am Dutch time our final leg of the journey reveals the entrance to the world-renowned Kirkenhof Gardens. It's a beautiful sunny morning, although cold, so I hope you have your warm coat. It's not too busy inside either, which is good. Let's take a map from that dispenser over there and get an idea of what we need to see. As you can see, the 79 acres is packed with beautiful things to see. There are four indoor displays. The Juliana Pavilion has an exhibition on tulip mania. The Beatrix Pavilion has an orchid and anthurium show. The Orania Nassau Pavilion has cut flower displays. And the Willem Alexander Pavilion has an extensive display of tulips where we'll see the latest trends. There are multiple garden rooms and walkways, a large lake and a cute windmill that we can climb to observe the bulb fields beyond the gardens. I love how the cover of the maps is made of 20% tulips. These are the tulips removed from the park in 2019 after the last opening and you can still see small pieces visible in the fabric of the paper. So let's go! The history of Kirkenhof Gardens is that it's built on the 15th century hunting grounds of Slot Tailinge. It was originally the castle's kitchen garden. The park, as it is now, was established in 1949 by a consortium of bulb growers and flower exporters to showcase their products. Kirkenhof is widely known for its tulips, but it also features numerous other flowers, including hyacinths, daffodils, crocuses, and fritillarias. Later on, lilies, roses, carnations, and irises can also be seen. As it's March, you'll note that many of the tulips are not yet open, like this big display near the main entrance. But the lovely thing about visiting so early in the season is that we can see plants that would brighten our gardens in March when little else is visible. Eleven years ago I visited Kirkenhof in prime tulip season, but the problem with that is that the displays, spectacular though they are, aren't something you can replicate in most gardens. Often they rely on tulips that are not properly perennial and besides, who has enough space to plant up vast borders with tulips alone? Nothing else can grow there for the rest of the year. We'll start off by going to the left of the main entrance. And here we have some lovely displays of hyacinths, daffodils and tulips. There's also a fountain and an old fashioned barrel organ.
take a turn to the right and enter into a section of the garden crisscrossed by a raised boardwalk. And here at the planting, it's more naturalistic than before. They've used crown fitillarias a lot in this section, and these are such handsome and architectural plants. They look wonderful planted with daffodils. The use of double hellebores as an understory for the tall fritillarias here is really beautiful. But do you notice the soil? It's very sandy, making the planting of bulbs quite easy. And this river of Muscari stretching as far as the eye can see is so impressive. I love this whole carpet of Scylla in full bloom. As you know, I've swathes of the blue glory of the snow in my garden, so I know that this little fellow is easy enough to grow. There are numerous early flowering cherry blossom trees on show and very formal plantings of crocuses. The planting of crocuses is interesting because normally this little spring bulb is grown in grass as an informal carpet, whereas in Kuchenhof they used very giant varieties of crocus, almost as if they'd been pumped up on steroids in formal displays. I really love this display of the crocus Rembrandt interplanted with variegated tulips. The tulips aren't even in bloom yet, but still the display looks great. We now take a quick detour into the Juliana Pavilion to see an exhibition on tulip mania and the Dutch golden age of the 1600s when a single tulip bulb sold for the price of a large house. The flamed and striped varieties were particularly loved by the Dutch, but these colour breaks were actually caused by a virus transmitted by aphids. 
the virus was unstable. But these things weren't properly understood at the time. So you can imagine people's dismay when the beautiful striped tulip that cost a fortune bloomed, but suddenly it was without any of its stripes. You'll see a lot of water in this garden, indicative of the fact that a lot of the Netherlands is reclaimed. There are canals and drills, waterfalls and lakes, moving water and still water offering reflections. You can even take a boat trip on the canals in among the tulip fields. Kirkenhof is only open to the general public for its world-renowned eight-week tulip display from mid-March to mid-May. Peak viewing happens near mid-April, depending on growing season weather, which can vary annually. Now for a few words on how these floral displays are designed. Planning happens a full year in advance. It's done on paper, but the designer visits the various sites to properly assess all adjacent features and take them into consideration. The designer also takes account of new trends and colours. Then there are discussions with the growers to assess what bulb volumes might be available and what particular bulbs the growers want to showcase. A plant list is then drawn, stipulating how many of which type of hyacinth, tulip and crocus are needed. The flower bulbs are delivered to the gardens from the 1st of October and planting starts in earnest. Each autumn, 40 gardeners plant the 7 million bulbs donated to the park by over 100 growers. There are numerous videos online that will show you the gardeners planting out the tulip bulbs at Kirkenhof. Firstly, the outlines of the beds are delineated and then the bulbs laid on top in their planting positions. Planting is all done by hand in the gardens, although the tulip fields are planted by machine. As the earth is pretty much pure sand, it's easy enough to dig and plant and gardeners use a trowel. As the bulbs will be removed after planting, there's no need to worry about planting them deeply. From watching online planting footage, it seems to me that the lawn areas are seeded annually after the bulbs are planted, and this explains how most of the lawns are so very fresh and young and green looking. Planting is usually completed by the 5th of December, which is Dutch Sinterklaas Day. Now we're going to visit the indoor tulip display in the Willem Alexander Pavilion and I guarantee that this will blow you away. Here in this indoor space there are multiple tulips grown in beds and arranged in gorgeous combination. Because these tulips are in a protected environment they've flowered early and perfectly but would normally be grown outdoors. It's hard to know where to look with such an overwhelming overload on the senses, but in fact, the growers have made it easy to assess and research these tulips as all are labelled and also show what division they belong to. As we know, there are 15 divisions or groupings of tulips and the division a tulip belongs to is key to whether or not it will return reliably. I have a video I'll link to above all about this. So here in this pavilion, I'll try to keep track of division information and not be totally besotted by fabulous blooms. Having said that I won't be besotted, I must say I'm very attracted to a couple of tulip varieties straight up, like these triumph ones here from division three. Here we have crown of dynasty, a soft, elegantly shaped pink. We also have Muvota, 
in dusky dark red and orange tones. This pink and white one called Whispering Dreams is also mouth-watering, very lily-flowered in its shape. And check out this black tulip called Hot Chocolate. For centuries, growers have been trying to create the elusive black tulip However, black isn't a colour that exists in nature. Various techniques were used, including crossing reds and yellows, to get a very, very dark tulip. If you look closely, even at this fabulous hot chocolate, then you can see that it isn't actually black, just a very dark purple. Whereas I am naturally drawn to triumph tulips because of their beautiful form and colours. They are unfortunately not reliably perennial, so they aren't for me. Now we have a double early from Division 2 called Monte Cassino. Despite its vibrant colour, this is also a division that doesn't produce repeat flowering tulips, so sadly I'll have to pass. Next up, we have Rasta Parrot from Division 10, the Parrot Division. Have you ever seen such mesmerising colours? I'm completely hypnotised by how the oranges, the dark reds and the yellows blend together in this masterpiece. I feel myself slipping on my principles here. I may actually have to just buy a packet of this Rasta Parrot, even though it's not a reliable returner. It's just too fabulous. But let's move on to tulips that I can have. And this one here is called Orange Marmalade from the Veridiflora Group, Division 8. The thing about Viridiflora tulips is that they have chlorophyll, not only in their leaves, like any other tulip, but also in their flowers. Thus, the flower is partially green. This somewhat surprising pigmentation gives them an advantage when it comes to storing energy. Since the flower also carries out photosynthesis like a leaf, the bulb picks up extra reserves and thus tends to bloom again very well, provided you plant them deeply enough. I will definitely be looking out for this beauty. Next up, we catch sight of a glorious yellow called Sweetheart from the Fosteriana group, Division 13. This is a division of botanical tulips and they're brilliant for coming back. This one just sings spring to me. Now let's check out a couple of Darwin hybrids from Division 4. These tulips are the result of a cross between the species tulip Fosteriana and the more conventional hybrid tulips. The result is a huge tulip with a large flower and a bulb nearly twice as big as those of other hybrid tulips. Darwin hybrids inherit the perennial nature of their botanical Fosteriana relative and will come back if planted deeply enough. Now here's something interesting in the form of a Gregii tulip from Division 14. How unusual to find such a large flower on such a short stem. It'd be very useful in a windy site I imagine. Like many Gregii tulips, the foliage is mottled with brown, which is an added feature. Like Kaufmanniana tulips, Gregii are short and early and reliably hardy. We'll see some Kaufmanniana ones outside in the gardens in a little while. Perhaps you've been wondering about the process to create new tulip varieties. Well, I can tell you that tulips take 25 years from seed until when they're available to us in the shops. 
The process starts by cross-pollination, using pollen from one tulip and applying it with a brush to the pistil of another tulip. If pollination is successful, the ovary then swells and makes about 200 seeds. The seed is sown in autumn and by spring it produces small grass-like shoots. Planting and harvesting then continues for several years until at about year five when the seedling first flowers. The selection process is ruthless and 99.9% .9 of all seedlings will be discarded at this stage. Only plants that have exceptional flowers in terms of form, colour, size or blooming time, or probably all four, are kept. After many years of growing, trialling and increasing stock, the new variety of tulip eventually hits the shops for you and me to purchase it. And finally, a quick look at some begonia and houseplant displays at the edge of this pavilion before we head out again to look at the gardens. in the distance. Can you see the windmill beckoning to us? This is an old-fashioned windmill for which Holland is quite famous and we can climb up inside it to see the bulb fields beyond. There are golden daffodils on view at this time and what a fabulous sight they make. If you visit later on in the season, as I did 11 years ago, you'll see carpets of tulips in varying colours, like the photos I'm inserting now. One tulip that really steals the show here at Kokenhof is the Kaufmanniana from Division 12. This tulip is known as the water lily tulip. It has medium large, creamy yellow flowers, often with red stripes on the outside and with yellow at the centre. Stems are 15 centimetres or 6 inches tall, which makes it a short tulip. This is a botanic tulip made from crosses of Tulipa kaufmanniana and its hybrids, and that means that it'll come back for you in your garden for years and years. This particular one here is Giuseppe Verdi, and I had it for so many years in my garden. On a dull day, you get the typical lipstick shape to the flowers and can see the red stripes on the outside of the petals as they stay closed. But on a sunny day, those petals, they just fall right open and you can see right inside its throat, as if the tulip were laughing at the sun. An absolute cutie.
now we enter the Beatrix Pavilion to see the orchid exhibition. I was really looking forward to this as when I visited before there were lots of cymbidiums on show and there were plants for sale. Last time I bought a Papiopedilum here, the complex American hybrid one that you've seen in many of my videos. This time, however, I come away with nothing. It may be that my taste in orchids has matured over the years. I must say, I'm really taken with many of the daffodil displays at the gardens. The blooms with both yellow and white in the same flower are particularly appealing and many are scented. I do feel tempted to try something similar at home with masses of the one type of daffodil. I'll have to think about it, but for the moment I'll just say, watch this space. Now let's have a little look at a few varieties of daffodil that caught my eye, although not all are labelled. This beauty is really striking with its multiple flower heads and upright habit. Normally daffodils bend and nod, but this fellow is quite unusual in its habit. The scent is also very sweet and drifts on the air. But before we all rush out and mass plant this beauty, it's worth noting that it belongs to the Tazetta or paper white group of daffodils. So I wouldn't be confident that this one would be hardy in my garden. I'm writing the daffodil names up on the screen in case you fancy sourcing any of them. Lots of daffs from division two, the large cupped types and all would be hardy for me. This one called Winter Waltz. It's hardy and from the Cyclaminous Daffodil group, which we can see by the shape of its reflexed flowers. Now let's visit the Orania Nassau Pavilion where cut flowers are on display. There are some really funky looking creations here. But the thing that really strikes me is how the vases of flowers are basked in very moody lighting, making them reminiscent of a painting by one of the Dutch masters. Did delphiniums ever look this good? Now 
Now, I think I might have mentioned before how there are one or two water features in this garden. So when you finish looking at the inventive ways water can be channeled, let's hear a bit about how tulips came to Holland. Tulips originally come from Turkey and they were first noticed by the West around 1550 when the Turkish Sultan Suleiman II had numerous beautiful varieties in his palace gardens. The Sultan gave some bulbs to the Austrian ambassador who in turn passed them to the Dutch Carolus Clusius who was a doctor and plant collector. The first tulips to flower in Holland were in 1593. I think the country has never looked back since. Up until now, when we've seen fritillarias in this garden, they've been the crown variety with their tall architectural flowers. At home, these always flower reliably for me in their first year and then never again. I think it's down to the lack of sun in summer in Ireland, which is needed to bake the bulbs and make them reflower. This little fellow, on the other hand, is a different story. This is the snake's head fritillaria and it's called this because of the patterning on its petals. It's a much smaller plant than the crown fritillaria, much less of a prima donna, but it does do well for me and returns reliably in a woodlandsy setting. In terms of fritillarias, this one is my pick. Now we find ourselves in a section of the garden at the big lake. It's so beautiful here with the water and the fountain and the bulbs planted underneath the trees. To tell the truth, I nearly didn't make it to this section as I lost my map and I'm beginning to feel extremely tired. I am so glad I didn't miss this section though. Look at that guy over there walking on water. I bet my kids would love to try that. There are actually stepping stones just below the surface of the water and I would have a go but I don't want to get wet feet for the return journey on the buses and the plane. And now we're nearing the end of this visit to the glorious Kuchenhof Gardens in March. There's been so much to see and so many ideas to take away. Do let me know what your favourite bit was. I must say that for me, some of the daffodil displays were absolutely breathtaking and they have certainly fired my imagination. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it will inspire you to plan your own trip to Kuchenhof if you can. If I were to do it again, I think I might plan for an overnight as all the traveling has been just a bit tiring. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.